In this video, we're going to cover peptides and protein mediators, including their biosynthesis, storage, release, and metabolism. We'll also explore their effects and related drugs on glucose control and cardiovascular function. But before we start the lecture, be a sweet neuron and subscribe to the channel. Once you've done that, let's start this lecture by first defining what peptides are. Okay. Peptides are essentially small proteins made up of amino acids, much like proteins, but they differ mainly in size. Peptides typically range from about 3 to 200 amino acids, whereas proteins contain many more amino acids. And unlike proteins, which often have complex folded structures, peptides can be more flexible. Some are as short as, like I said, three amino acids, while others may have disulfide bonds or form partial cyclic shapes. And one key feature of most peptides is that they have an N-terminal and a C-terminal residue at each end. And peptides are found throughout the body. They exist in the nervous system as neuropeptides, as well as in the in endocrine glands or endocrine organs like the pituitary, thyroid, adrenal glands, and reproductive organs. You can also find them in plasma, the heart, and the vascular endothelium. And these small molecules are involved in a wide range of functions, though we still don't fully understand all their roles. What we do know is that peptides regulate pain, food intake, metabolism, reproduction, cardiovascular and gastrointestinal functions, inflammation, and higher brain functions such as reward, uh, social interaction, learning, and memory. So peptides have a wide range of functions, wide range of actions throughout the body, and their effects can either be inhibitory or excitatory, and they can act both presynaptically and postsynaptically. Now, when we talk about peptide mediators, we're referring to peptides that act as messengers. So what they do is they help transmit signals between cells and play a role in regulating a wide range of physiological processes. So that's the basics. Let's now subtract complexity and move on to peptide storage and release. Now, we won't go through this in detail. I'm going to leave a link below to the cell biology playlist. All right. Peptide synthesis begins with the creation of a precursor protein, often called a pre hormone, which contains the embedded peptide sequence. Now, the N-terminal signal peptide right here is then cleaved, okay, to form the pro-hormone. And enzymes known as endopeptidases further cleave the pro-hormone to release the individual peptide fragments. And these peptides may be active as they are, or they may undergo additional post-translational modifications such as amidation, sulfation, or further cleavage. And a pro-hormone can contain multiple peptides within its sequence. Now, where are they synthesized? Look at this. So peptides are synthesized by ribosomes. Recall that ribosomes consist of a large subunit and a small subunit, and the peptides go through the rough endoplasmic reticular membrane, after which they are transported in vesicles to the Golgi apparatus. And from here, they are sorted and packaged into secretory vesicles, where some processing occurs, such as cleavage, amidation, or sulfation. Now, peptides are stored in these vesicles and released by exocytosis when needed. They are often stored as large protein sequences until required. Okay, So when the body needs the peptide to act, a signal triggers the vesicles to move toward the cell membrane. Okay, The vesicles then fuse with the cell membrane and the peptide is released into the extracellular space, so the space outside the cell. And this is known as exocytosis. And one of the most important aspects of this process is that the release of peptides is typically calcium dependent. What do I mean by that? Let's go through this. So when the cell receives a signal, calcium ions rush into the cell. And this sudden influx of calcium triggers the fusion of the vesicle with the cell membrane. So once fused, the vesicle releases its content, so the active peptide, 
into the extracellular space. So this calcium-dependent exocytosis ensures that the peptide is released only when needed, and the release, the, this release process is tightly regulated. Okay. So then what happens when these peptides are released? Well, once they're released, peptides like neurotransmitters act on cell surface receptors, usually G-protein coupled receptors, though there are some exceptions. And peptides differ from classical neurotransmitters in a few key ways. So number one, they are stored in axon terminals as large secretory granules. They act at lower concentrations. They are slower to take effect and their actions last longer. Okay, so there's a few key differences there. Now, once peptides are released and they bind to their receptors, their actions need to be terminated. And this leads us to a process known as catabolism or proteolysis. So during catabolism, peptides and proteins are broken down by enzymes called peptidases or proteases, which reduce them into smaller polypeptides or individual amino acids, okay? And again, peptides are found throughout the body, whether in the digestive system, where they help break down dietary proteins, or in cells, where they regulate peptide signaling. And some peptides, some peptidases, okay, the enzyme, remove terminal amino acids by cleaving them from one end of the peptide, while others break internal bonds. So this enzyme, Peptidases can be quite versatile, often responsible for cleaving multiple peptides or proteins. For example, a, a single peptidase might contribute to the catabolism of several different peptides. As mentioned earlier, peptides play roles throughout the body, which affect which with effects that can either be inhibitory or excitatory. And they can both they can act both presynaptically and postsynaptically, and their influence can spread over short or long distances from the point of release. And this leads us to how peptides often function as co-transmitters, working alongside other peptides or neurotransmitters. So what's co-transmission? So this is when peptides are released alongside traditional neurotransmitters at synapses. And this is a powerful mechanism that allows the nervous system to fine tune its responses to stimuli, whether it's regulating pain, digestion, or learning. Let's break down how this works. Unlike neurotransmitters, which are typically associated with specific neurons, peptides are stored within neurons that also produce other neurotransmitters. So this means peptides can be released simultaneously with neurotransmitters like glutamate or acetylcholine. That's beautiful, right? In this process, a single nerve terminal releases multiple types of neurotransmitters. We see this co-localization of neuroactive substances in nearly all types of neurons, both in the central nervous system and in the periphery. Okay, so neurons commonly produce a conventional neurotransmitter, such as dopamine, acetylcholine, or adrenaline, along with one or more peptides. And the release of both these uh, large uh, vesicles, granules containing peptides, and small vesicles containing neurotransmitters is regulated differently. Okay, and this relates back to the different stimuli that trigger the release of peptides, proteins, and hormones compared to the action potential that stimulates neurotransmitter release. Okay, so that's co-transmission. Let's focus on pharmacology now, all right? Because the question is, can peptides be used as drugs? Given their wide range of functions in the body, many proteins are indeed used as drugs drugs, but smaller peptides are typically only used therapeutically when no other alternatives exist. And a great example is insulin and growth hormone. Though synthetic growth hormones are becoming more common now, so insulin is our example here. With that said though, peptides also face several challenges as drugs. Number one, they can't be taken orally because they are rapidly broken down by gastrointestinal enzymes. Number two, they're poorly absorbed and they have a short 
half-life, okay? They have a short half-life. And for neurological diseases where neuropeptides play a role, there's an additional hurdle, and that is the blood-brain barrier, which makes it difficult for peptides to reach their target sites, okay? But what we're going to do now for this next part is we're going to focus on peptides involved in glucose control and cardiovascular function. Okay. Let's start with insulin. So insulin is a key peptide in the regulation of blood glucose levels. Insulin is a hormone produced by beta cells in the pancreas, and its primary role is to help the body maintain stable blood glucose levels, ensuring that cells have the energy they need to function properly. Now, its synthesis and secretion, again, are regulated by blood glucose levels and the rate at which blood glucose changes. And it consists of 51 amino acids, and is classified as a dimer with an A chain and a B chain connected by disulfide bonds. So what happens is when we eat, glucose from food enters the bloodstream, and this triggers the pancreas to release insulin into the blood, which then acts on various tissues to regulate glucose levels. When insulin is released, it binds to the insulin receptor, a tyrosine kinase receptor, promoting the absorption of glucose into the liver, fat, and skeletal muscles. Take a look at the receptor lecture in the pharmacology playlist because we go through how tyrosine kinase receptors work, and it's incredible. Okay, so insulin is used therapeutically to treat type 1 diabetes, also known as diabetes mellitus. So this is a disease where insulin function or production is impaired, leading to chronic high blood glucose levels. Okay, and it's typically diagnosed in children lasting throughout life. So this condition results from autoimmune destruction of pancreatic beta cells, meaning patients can't produce their own insulin. So for these patients, insulin therapy administered by injection of the air pump is really important. It helps regulate blood sugar levels, ensures glucose is delivered to target tissues, and prevents blood glucose levels from rising too high. So insulin is arguably one of the most important peptide treatments available today. Okay, that's insulin. Let's now move on to angiotensin peptides, which play a role in cardiovascular and renal function. All right, what we're going to do first is take a look at an overview of the renin angiotensin system, because this is a hormone system that plays a key role in regulating blood pressure, fluid balance, and electrolyte levels. Okay, we're going to go through this step by step. So what's step one? So step one is renin release. So when blood pressure or blood volume is low or sodium levels drop, the kidneys release renin into the bloodstream. Then step number two is the conversion of angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. So renin acts on a protein called angiotensinogen, which is produced by the liver and secreted into the blood. What renin is going to do is it cleaves angiotensinogen into a smaller peptide called angiotensin 1. And angiotensin 1 is relatively inactive at this point, but it does serve as the precursor for angiotensin 2. Step 3 is the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. So angiotensin 1 is converted into the active peptide angiotensin 2 by the enzyme angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE, primarily in the lungs. So ACE this enzyme removes two amino acids from angiotensin 1, producing angiotensin 2, which is the biologically active form. Okay, that's an overview. Let's break this down further. So the most important peptide in the angiotensin system is angiotensin 2, also written as ANG2 or A2. So despite being only eight amino acids long, it is the key active peptide in the renin angiotensin system. And it plays a really important role in both peripheral and central functions in the body. So angiotensin 2 controls vasoconstriction, okay, which raises blood pressure and blood volume. It's really important for cardiac and vascular hypertrophy, as well as sodium and fluid retention and the secretion of aldosterone. And angiotensin 2 is also found in the brain. Okay, so looking at this overview here, we see that angiotensinogen serves as the precursor or the pre-pro hormone in this system. 
in response to various physiological triggers, like a drop in the in arterial blood pressure detected by baroreceptors, or a decrease in sodium sodium levels in the kidney, renin is secreted. Okay, so let's go through this again. Renin converts angiotensinogen into the pro-hormone angiotensin one which is then converted by ACE into the active peptide angiotensin 2. So this active peptide can then bind to its receptors. And there are two main types of angiotensin 2 receptors. We have AT1 and AT2. So the AT1 receptor is responsible for most of well-known effects of ANG2, okay, such as cardiovascular control, and it, it functions through a G-protein coupled mechanism that activates phospholipase C and increases cytosolic calcium levels. Now that's AT1. The AT2 receptor, it's less well understood uh, and mainly expressed during fetal and neonatal stages and only in small amounts in specific adult regions. It's thought to play a role in growth and development, but its exact function remains unclear. So our main receptor here is the AT1. So this diagram here, right, you can see the mode that most of angiotensin's two functions are mediated through the AT1 receptor. So for example, high levels of AT1 receptors are found in blood vessels and the human medulla oblongata, which is a brain region crucial for cardiovascular function. And ANG2 and its AT1 receptors are also just really important in cardiovascular control. Okay, so then, What's the clinical use here? So drugs that target the renin angiotensin system are really important, clinically important, especially when it comes to managing conditions like high blood pressure. And one key class of drugs is angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or ACE inhibitors. So as a reminder, okay, ACE is the enzyme responsible for converting the pro-hormone angiotensin 1 into the active peptide angiotensin 2. So ACE inhibitors block this conversion, preventing the formation of angiotensin 2. Because remember, remember what uh, angiotensin 2 does, right? So examples of ACE inhibitors include perenopril and ramipril, which are commonly used to treat high blood pressure. So by inhibiting ANG2 formation, these drugs lower arterial pressure and reduce cardiac load. Okay, they also decrease sodium retention and the release of aldosterone. As a result, ACE inhibitors are used, like I said, to treat hypertension, heart failure, and you know, and these are among the most widely prescribed medications worldwide. Okay. Now, of course, that's the effects, but they can also have some adverse effects, including a dry cough, which occurs due to the interaction with another peptide bradykinin that ACE also affects. So hypotension, low blood pressure can also be a side effect. So those are ACE inhibitors. The second class of drugs related to ANG2 are the angiotensin receptor blockers, okay? So these are antagonists that target the AT1 receptors of angiotensin 2. So examples include losartan and telmisartan, okay? So like ACE inhibitors, these receptor blockers are used to treat similar conditions such as hypertension and heart failure, but they work by blocking the effects of angiotensin II without affecting bradykinin, which is the peptide responsible for the, tri the dry cough often seen with ACE inhibitors. So these receptor blockers help lower arterial pressure, reduce cardiac load, and decrease sodium retention and aldosterone release, which makes them effective for managing hypertension, heart failure, and other related conditions.